Hi everyone, I'm Alistair Ben and you're watching Express Photography. Uh, in this week's video, I want to ask the question, do landscape photographers even need Photoshop? Before we start, any regular viewers to the channel will recognize that we have got rid of some of the guitars in the background. Some people were finding them a little bit distracting and I am going through a bit of an office overhaul right now. So we're trying to make this a little bit of a better recording space. In last week's video, I gave five compelling reasons why Lightroom is actually superior to Photoshop, uh, or at least it was as good as Photoshop for landscape photography. Uh, Lightroom has come on leaps and bounds over the last decade, really, and has becoming more and more well-functioned. And I personally do find myself staying in Adobe Lightroom much, much longer than I ever used to. I used to do all my processing in Photoshop in about 2010. Now I probably use it a lot, lot less. But in short, do landscape photographers even need Photoshop? The simple answer is yes, we do. Uh, and in this video, I want to cover some of the reasons why I really do go into Photoshop and look at some of those simpler techniques or some of those techniques to demonstrate to you why we really do need both these tools, both Adobe Lightroom and Adobe Photoshop. The first reason uh, to look at Photoshop is advanced cloning. Uh, the spot healing brush in Adobe Lightroom has improved very much so, especially in the more uh, recent releases with some sort of content aware capabilities. However, it is a poor comparison to what you can do in Adobe Photoshop. If we look at this photograph as an example, uh, this has somewhat worked already in Lightroom, uh, but you can see there are some areas around the edges, particularly in here and up in the top right hand corner there that I would prefer to simplify. If we open the same image in Adobe Photoshop, you can see we have various uh, ways of doing things, spot healing brush, healing brush, patch tool, content aware, move tool, etc. And this isn't a video about advanced cloning, but you, we can see just with the content aware fill, how quickly we can skip around these areas and even quite advanced cloning, you know, to, and you just have to go over these things a couple of times. And Photoshop does such a great job to simplify and to use the cloning techniques. And it really is quite remarkable, this content aware fill. And you can see the open, uh, the original file uh, has all of these distractions. And then once we've done a little bit of uh, spot healing, we have simplified the image significantly. This is a very quick and easy thing to do and Photoshop is the best place for it. The second reason to go into Photoshop is warping and transformations. Uh, warping is a, a technique that I use an awful lot. Um, and if we take this image as an example, you can see we have during my composition, you know, you're so busy looking through the frame that sometimes you lose uh, the edges a little bit. And we've got this sliver up here at the top right hand side. I'm going to fix this using the warp technique. Now, of course, we have a couple of sensor spots on here and with that same spot healing brush, we can get rid of those very quickly. And if we zoom into this top right hand corner, you can see that we do have this sliver of uh, land on the corner there. Now, it can be tempting to come in and clone that out or to even use spot healing and so forth. What I don't like to do is clone areas in uh, when we've got very little texture and very little contrast, I would prefer to warp that out rather than to actually try and clone it. It's way easier to get uh, artifacts forming. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to make a simple selection of that uh, top right hand corner of the frame and I'm going to use Command T or Control T on a PC to get my transform windows. You can also use edit transform and that does the same thing. And in this case, I'm going to use warp. You can use that as a menu item or you can just click on this little icon up here, which is a shortcut to the warp tool. And I'm just gonna simply lift that out. 
Now we can see that we do have a little bit of the, uh, almost like a current line. I'm actually going to warp that whole area out. This is excellent for um, changing the, sometimes we get very wide angle distortion or we get things in compositions that we just want to move a little bit of it out of the frame. And this is an excellent way to do that. And you can see, and then Command D or Control D on a Mac to get rid of that. If we can see now, we now have a much tidier top right hand corner. And the warp function is something I use a lot. You can actually see this bottom right hand corner here. And I'll just use this as a second example. So Command T and then warp. We can change how that corner just drops into the frame there. So we can actually change the geometry of that corner uh, quite significantly just with a little warp there. And it's a wonderful way to just tidy up edges of frames. And we're talking subtle adjustments, but at the same time, they are significant adjustments. Now, anyone who's uh, an advanced Photoshop user knows that the LAB color space or the lab color space is an excellent reason to be in Adobe Photoshop. It is absent from Adobe Lightroom. We only have RGB there. And one of the biggest problems with the RGB color space is that saturation of colors and their hue are directly linked to contrast. So if I come in and increase the contrast of this photograph, which is basically stretching the histogram there, you can see that the colors are also getting more saturated. So we have quite a plain uh, color space here or color combinations. And as we increase contrast, they also get uh, more saturated. Now, it's no coincidence that the LAB color space is also nicknamed the Canyon color space. It's an excellent way of separating tones that are very, very similar and increasing the contrast between colors that are very, very similar. This is a photograph I took in Morocco a couple of years ago. And you can see that we have a very delicate color space here. But I'm going to go in and go uh, from image into mode and then check the LAB color space. And you can see now that we have moved out of RGB into LAB. The most significant way of dealing with LAB is using the curve. And just very, very briefly, I'll cover this. We now have instead of the, the, the composite channel and then the RGB channels, the four different ways we can adjust contrast. We now have three. One covers lightness, which is just contrast. And then we have the A channel and B channel. I can add significant contrast to the L channel. You know, that's a pretty meaty S curve. But you can see there's been very little color shift. The, the colors are very, very pure. We have increased their luminosity somewhat, but we haven't changed their hue. And that is a massive adjustment that we can do in LAB that we cannot really do in RGB very well. We can also increase uh, color contrast by, let's make a significant adjustment. And one of the little quirks of LAB color space is that you can introduce color casts if you don't make adjustments that are equal. So you can see here we have a plus and minus and there we have minus 95 and plus 95. And what we're doing is we're keeping that line going through the center of those two curves, the A and the B curve. But you can see now we have significantly more color contrast and tonal contrast. And if we go back to the original file and to the later file, the color uh, integrity has been maintained and the LAB color space is an incredibly good reason to go into Adobe Photoshop. Reason number four is to be able to use layers. Uh, layers are particularly useful. We can use uh, them obviously for adjustments like I just did in the LAB color space there uh, by using a curves adjustment layer, but we can also use them for more advanced uh, landscape photography techniques or macro techniques such as focus stacking uh, or indeed focal length blending. 
I'm actually going to make a video for next weekend covering my way of focus stacking for uh, photographs where there is movement in the frame. Uh, it's one of the greatest problems that we have is focus stacking, moving images. So tune in next week for the tutorial on focus stacking. But in this week's video, let's just look at a very, very simple example. As I note, uh, made note last week, um, Lightroom is excellent for um, synchronizing adjustments across multiple photographs. Here we have three individual images and this one is focused for the back, the middle one is focused for the middle and the front one is focused for the front. I could have probably done with another image actually because the front is still out of focus. But I've made some very simple adjustments here uh, in Lightroom and synchronized the, the settings across the three different images. If I select those three images and right click on them and uh, open as layers in Photoshop, we end up with a single uh, file or a single uh, Photoshop session with the three individual files there. The simplest way to blend these is to just select all three, select edit and auto align layers and that is going to make this adjustment. And what that's doing is adjusting for the, the different focal points. As you change focus, the image actually shifts, it changes. Uh, so what we're doing here is we're, we're aligning the content. Photoshop does an excellent job of that. The next stage is to go edit auto blend layers. And just to save time, I've done that in advance. And you can see that we now have an image which is tack sharp all the way through its focal range there. So you can still see we do have an out of focus section there and that's just because we've, we, you lose a little bit of real estate when you uh, crop in there because of the way that the, the images are being adjusted. But quite quickly we can just crop in, get rid of that and we end up with a file that is uh, somewhat focused from front through to back. Like I said, tune in next week if you would like to see an advanced tutorial on how to focus stack when in particular we've got things like moving water uh, or things like that or moving vegetation. It's a, it's a little smart trick that I'd like love to share with you. There are many other reasons that I would move into Adobe Photoshop and we don't have time to cover them all today. But one of the major ones that I will just highlight is luminosity masks. In last week's Lightroom video, we now know that we have some uh, Lightroom or we do have some luminosity mask functionality available to us, but it is quite limited. It's okay for broad brush strokes. It's okay to, to make quick adjustments if we want to get a feel for how things are going. But there are many plugins available now for Adobe Photoshop the Tony Kuiper, uh, to name just one out of many. I know some of you use all sorts of different plugins to make luminosity masks. I have been using uh, Tony Kuiper's luminosity mask panel since 2010 and have a very long association with it. Um, it is incredibly powerful and allows us to do all sorts of incredible things. Not least, I tend to use it for lots of simple little shortcuts black brush selection, white brush selection, uh, blending mode selection, flattening the image, uh, all sorts of different ways of making selections and adjustments. But of course, the primary reason we all go into Photoshop, uh, go into one of these luminosity mass panels is to make uh, selections based upon either a specific tonal range. So these are light masks on this side and it allows us to make a selection of a certain tonal range. Um, this is lights, of course, we can go into the shadows and make uh, selections for those. Once we have our selections, we can use any uh, way of enhancing or changing those selections. This is by far the most powerful way to make micro adjustments, very detailed adjustments. And like I said, I've been using it for 12 years now. Uh, and if you want to get the most out of uh, your image processing, then jumping into one of these plugins is probably the best way to go. With the caveat that if you don't understand how to do it in Adobe Lightroom, going into Photoshop is going to give you an incredibly steep learning curve. I think what I'd like to do here is to just balance this concept that 
There are people who advocate that you should do all your processing in Adobe Photoshop, and there are others who say you never need to leave Lightroom at all. I am somewhat in between. Adobe Lightroom over the last five or six years since Creative Cloud really has become an incredibly powerful tool. And if you haven't watched last week's video, jump in because there are many compelling reasons to do the majority of your processing in Adobe Lightroom. Uh, I find it an excellent place to quickly determine mood and feel and to get an idea of what I may want to do with a photograph and in many cases can do everything that I want to do in Adobe Lightroom. However, the reasons that I've uh, offered to you today are excellent reasons and excellent um, things where we have to move into Adobe Photoshop. Things like using the LAB color space uh, many of you know that I use the history brush to do dodging and burning. That is some other reason to come in here as well. Tune in next week when I'm going to be doing an advanced focus stacking tutorial to show you my way of doing it, which I've never seen anybody else doing. So I'm either a freak or a genius, one of those two. Um, and I look forward to sharing some more of my insights towards expressive photography and creativity with you over the coming months. And of course, don't forget that if you want your copy of Out of Darkness, my first photo book, 160 pages, 132 photographs, four words by William Neal and Joe Cornish, plus my own essays, uh, then please click on the link below to check that out as well. Please, if you haven't done so already, click the subscribe button, give me a thumbs up, jump into the comments, give me more reasons why I should be moving into Photoshop instead of staying in Adobe Lightroom. Uh, and don't remember, don't forget, midweek, there'll be another critique session with myself and Adam Gibbs. This is an ongoing series where people have sent in their photos and we are just choosing one or two a week to go in and give our two cents worth. Uh, we're getting some nice feedback on those and hopefully you get some value from those as well. Thanks for tuning in. As always, I really appreciate the time that you spend watching these videos and it gives me a great honour to talk to you again. Bye for now.